Hello, everyone. I think the um, Zoom settings were throwing people off a little bit. So I think it's taking people a couple minutes to join, but it should be fixed now. Hopefully. Oh, this little doggy. The little foster dog who is very shy, but just came up and like nudged my foot. So that was a nice surprise. How's everyone doing? What was the, um, Bobby, we came up with an icebreaker and I can't remember what it is now. Do you remember? Sorry, just give me one sec. Jose just emailed and said he was having some trouble with a link. So I'm just trying to get that. I made it. <laughs> ah, hi. Everyone was having trouble with the link, not just you. Like, I let marketing, I let Marcom know. So hopefully it's fixed now. I went in and tried to change the settings. Um, so it should be, should be good. Cool. Sorry about right. that. Okay. No, it's okay. I, you know, this morning I was like, I hate being late to things. <laughs> and so here, all right. So, um, hi everyone. So we were, I was trying to remember Bobby and I had an icebreaker, but I can't remember what it is. Um, do you have an icebreaker for us? And then I can introduce you. I don't. <laughs> trying to think of what, what it was, Bobby, do you remember? No, it's just, I was thinking of more about margaritas than icebreakers. Can you <laughs> what I'm right about now? Margaritas. Someone put in the chat, like a first car, like listing your first car. List it's something. All right. Okay, cool. Jose, Do motorcycles you count? So long. How are you? Wait, what was that? I haven't seen you in so long. It's so good to see you, Monica, and hear your voice. I know that voice. <laughs> One day I will see you again in person. I know it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So yeah, if you want to go ahead and list your first car in the chat, we'll get moving. Um, I am super excited to have a friend of mine here today who is a genius in his work and really leading our field towards um, more inclusion and belonging and improving our culture across the field. And um Without further ado, I think many of you probably know Jose Ocaño, um, but we are really lucky to have you here today, Jose. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Rory. And I'm so excited to spend some time with some old friends that I haven't seen or talked to in a long time. And I'm seeing a lot of names of folks that I haven't met yet. So I'm excited for us to get to interact today too. Um, my name is Jose. I'm the Senior Director of Culture and People at Best Friends, which is, um, a transition for me. My background has always been in sheltering. You know, I worked at Pima Animal Care Center for about a decade in a number of roles from um, starting at the very entry level role of euthanasia technician. And then I was the director um, before Kristen came on board and did some incredible work. Uh, I also spent some time working at the SPCA of Central Florida, now called Pet Alliance of Greater Orlando for a few years. Um, under the leadership of Fraley Rodriguez. Some of you may know him. He now works for Best Friends, yay us. <laughs> um, but Fraley is a great friend and mentor. And so when Julie asked me to take on this culture role, which was really kind of a pivot for me from kind of front, uh, because my role at Best Friends was the Pacific Regional Director and I ran our LA programming. So it was kind of a shift for me to go and really just focus on not programs and actually internally. And so like I run, all, I manage in my portfolio all of, human resources and all the components of that, as well as oversee our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And all of that, the foundation of all that work is culture. So I'm gonna, I have a little bit of a presentation to kind of share with you how I think about culture and some of the ways that we're approaching this work. By no means is this the only way to do it. Um, I think that all of our organizations are unique. And so I think how it looks for your organization might vary, but I think the questions that I'm like endeavoring to answer on this culture journey are ones that we should all work on. So let's see how good I am at sharing my screen. Ah, uh, not this, share screen. Let's see if I were to go here. All right, Do -do -do. so many new things. Where is my little icon to play? 
I'm always one of those. I'm the I'm the guy who's always like has someone who's running the slides for me. <laughs> so, all right, can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. So I actually want to kind of start off a question with all of you, and you can feel free to throw comments in the chat, or if you want to kind of just unmute. Um, what is culture? Um, why does culture matter? Like, let's just start there. Like, what what is not so much what is culture, but like why does it matter? Curious to get your guys' thoughts. Yeah, I'm gonna look at the chat to see hey, if there's Kathy. any. It's Kathy from Canada, in case you haven't met me. <laughs> Hi, Kathy from Canada. <laughs> um, I feel like culture drives an organization. So yeah. it matters a lot. Yeah, I always think about culture as our how. It's how every organization has a culture. You, If you're like best friends, you might have five or six cultures, depend like the clinic has a culture, the shelter has a culture, the animal control or protection officers have a culture, you know, like everyone kind of has a way of doing things. The question is, is culture happening to us or are we creating an intentional culture to kind of drive the outcomes that we want? So what about um, culture equals whether people stay or whether people go? Yeah, there's, it's interesting. There's so much science and research now that kind of speaks to the importance um, and prominence of workplace culture. At this point, it is one of the key deciding factors on what, uh, um, what someone, why someone joins your organization and what keeps them. And there's a lot of money that gets spent on turnover. And so there's cost implications too, um, when you don't have a culture that is intentional. What else? What else are you thinking? Um, what, why it matters? Impacts customer service totally. The culture, you know, one of the things that I that I think about for me is culture is how your team and your staff and how you experience working at and for your organization. And we spend the majority of our awakened life at work. So I venture to say that that matters a whole ton, <laughs> how we experience that. You know, I've never subscribed to this belief system that I just got to do what I got to do for 30 or 40 years. And then I get to do what I want. And then I get to retire and have this life. It's no, I want to be fulfilled, happy, motivated. Now, I'm not waiting for that to happen. It creates the tone of your organization. Yep. And it creates the tone of how you will interact with the community. So yes, all of these things are why culture matters. It's all, there's also a lot of research that shows that when you have an intentional culture, you're really positioned to like not only reach your goals, but exceed your goals. And, you know, I think about a lot and I never had culture was never something I had um, the fluency with that language. I always thought of it as like staff morale, staff satisfaction. So there's also a lot of words that describe workplace culture. Um, and while I never had the words in the beginning of my career, I knew early on that how people experienced the job mattered really, really deeply to me. I wanted, I, I saw how much people sacrificed of themselves to do this work. And I felt it my opportunity and responsibility as a leader to really intentionally shape the kind of experience that I wanted people to have. And so that's why I, you know, essentially I've been doing culture work through change management for a deck for over a decade, but I never knew that's what it was. And so now that I've been in this role for about a year and a half, I've become a lot more attuned to the bigger picture and how all of, how it all kind of ties together. So culture matters a whole ton. Um, so let me advance my slides. All right, so I now wanna talk a little bit about some key questions that I've been asking myself and that I would encourage you to all to start to think about. And I'll go through each of these um, kind of questions individually, but how do we define our culture? That's a really important first step. Like what is, when we say culture, what, what, do, you, what do we mean by that? And how are we going to get the information to assess where we are and how we're doing based on that culture that we've predetermined is this thing. And how are we gonna measure our progress as we try to do the different things to improve our culture? And at the crux of it, what are we gonna do and how are we going to support our managers? Because the way that I always describe it is culture starts at the top. 
And so if any of you are in a leadership position, you are the, like, you know, the CEO, the director, you know, the kind of bucks, you know, starts and stops with you, then you completely set the tone for culture. But it is all of our responsibility to be additive to the culture. And so leadership sets the tone. And so I always think of this like saying on my big fat Greek wedding, it's one of my favorite movies. And she's like, the, the man is the, is the head, but the women, the woman of the house is the neck and she can turn that head any way she wants. And I think about culture as like the CEO sets the tone, but those managers are the neck and they can turn that culture any way they want. And so it's really important that as we do this work, we're really supporting managers in all of this. Because otherwise, if you just say, hey, your culture sucks, fix it. I'll tell, tell me how it's going in six months. That's not fair or reasonable and not setting someone up for success. So at Best Friends, the way we used to define our culture was by a set of values that we called our guiding principles. And some of you may have heard of them um, if you're familiar with Best Friends in our organization, but there's six of them. And this is really clearly what they are. There's the golden rule, kindness, positive influence, leadership, authenticity, and transparency. And these are the definitions that are accompanied. This is what you would find on our website. Um, we have been operating by these um, in this articulation for the last 10 years. So when we were in the, those early stages last year of, well, how do we define our culture? I realized that these um, guiding principles, and in particular, the definitions didn't provide a whole lot of clarity to the staff. They were, they were great. It was something, uh, it was more big picture, but they weren't really sure how they showed up every single day. They weren't rooted in like what behaviors are, when we say, you know, kindness, what does that actually mean in the workplace? So last year I did 40 workshops with all of our staff, our volunteers, and our founders, and I asked them, how do these behaviors show up in actions? And I got about a thousand pieces of feedback. And so what we've been, and then we were ready to actually roll out a lot of this work and then COVID hit. And so we redirected a lot of our efforts to kind of support our culture work in a different way to like the, what we ended up doing was saying, let's show up for our staff, secure people's jobs, make sure that that's not something they have to worry about. Let's make sure, let's up our well being efforts. Let's make sure we're really taking care of our staff. So we really showed up for them in a way that I think was meaningful. So when 2021 came about, we were ready to kind of pick up this kind of more formalized initiative. And so the results of all of that feedback from the staff are what we're now cal calling our guiding principles in action. And so the idea is that they're teachable, observable, measurable. There's five of them, and that's be kind, be big hearted, be well, be worthy of trust, and do the right thing. And so, for example, what we now have is a one page document that under each of these kind of headers, there's, you know, five to six bullet points that describe what we mean by that. And the fact is that was co-created by the staff. And that was a really, really important step because at the end of the day, we don't want just words that live on a website or something that we have people look at when they start with us and they sign it, you know, a la code of conduct. Um, we wanted something that is actually going to help us be accountable to ourselves and to each other on how we treat each other and how we go about our work every day. So that was really an important step in defining like when we say what's the culture at Best Friends, it's these five things and it's all the behaviors that make up these, these five items. I actually sent the um, document to Rory and so Rory is welcome to share that with the staff so you all can see it um, and see kind of what it looks like. So then we needed to figure out how are we going to get the information to assess this? And so surveys. And it's interesting because in this work, I've learned a lot about surveying and why they're so important and also how we can do them wrong by just coming up with our own questions. And a lot of times the questions are filled with bias. They're leading. Um, they're a big thing with employee engagement surveys, anonymity and emotional safety is a really important part in order to have data integrity and actually having people tell you what they really think. So what we're doing is we're partnering with a company called Energage to be our survey third party survey provider to do all the work for us. The cool thing is they have data scientists who help us with these are the questions you need to really ask that are really going to give you the insights you're looking for. They have a bunch of different tools. We can do some benchmarking to know where we land as it relates to the rest of their really, really large clientele. 
And, um, and the anonymity is really important to the staff because we, we heard that very loud and clear when we were doing some surveying last year. I also acknowledge that if I was the shelter director at Pima, I would there's no way I'd have a budget to spend $10,000 and hire a third party. So what I would do is, and what I've recommended to some other organizations is, this is also a really great project for like um, a master's student or just some kind of an intern who's doing some work in organizational development at a university. They're very, very capable of helping pull together the right questions for a survey. And you can still put some checks and balances in place to actually have some of that anonymity. So I always tell folks, don't let not having the resource to go to a third party deter you from this very critical step. I also liken the engagement survey um, to its people data. And it's as critical as our shelter data. And so think about how important data is in our sheltering world. And I, and I use that example because data also doesn't tell you the full story. You know, like you can look at data and you can put that, those through a save rate, a live release rate, whatever equation you're using to kind of measure your progress and your um, programs. But there's still people at the end of that. And there's still insights that you need to get. So I think of surveys as a compass. They, and they kind of tell you where you need to go and where you need to have additional um, conversations. So that's kind of how we're approaching how we're gonna get the information. But then there was still this big question of how are we going to measure our progress? And I have to tell you, our team has, we have worked really hard for like six months on this because when I, when I looked at how other organizations and other companies kind of declare success, I, I have found it to be not as well-rounded as it needs to be. It's like staff satisfaction or it's only employee engagement. And I think culture is so much more than that. So um, we started to really look at what are the different components of what we think matters to us for our organization. So I mentioned that we're using Energage. And Energage has their you know, employee engagement survey. That's pretty standard. It's a list of about 35 questions. And in those questions, there's key questions that tell you really critical things. So for instance, on their survey, they have three questions that tell you how engaged your staff are. And those things kind of boil down to motivation, um, loyalty, and likelihood to recommend. And then they have a set of questions that really tell you about how inclusive and, and how much belonging there is um, in your organization. So it really gets to that the I part of DE and I and the belonging component, which to me is like the ultimate like goal of DE and I is for everyone to have this deep sense of belonging. And then I mentioned, you saw um, those guiding principles in action. We're also gonna have staff answer questions on, hey, here's the statement of be kind and all of the things that you know we have co-defined as be kind. And on a scale from strongly agreed to strongly disagree, tell us how well we as an organization are living up to those values. And also tell, and the second question is, how well is your team doing that? And basically we take all of those dimensions and that gives us what we've created, which is a culture rate, similar to save rate, but it's a culture rate. So it's gonna really allow us for the first time at Best Friends to understand where we actually are at a baseline. And we're gonna use this long-term to continue to measure and track our success. So I'm really excited about this kind of innovation that's happening uh, at Best Friends. And so I wanted to give you an example of how this could work. And so here are, you know, there's some of those, here are those three questions at the top that kind of speak to engagement. Here are some of those four questions that speak to inclusion and belonging. And then there's the whole components of um, living our culture. And so you'll see what it's going to do is, you know, we'll get an org wide score. And then we'll be able to look at that against various departments and various divisions. And again, this is just a compass. This tells us like, so if let's say best friend says, we wanna have a 90%, because <laughs> you know we love 90% culture rate um, for every division across the entire organization, because we want every department and division to experience this good culture. This is gonna allow us to know like, what are we doing really well? And where are our opportunities to kind of go back and have additional conversations and create some action plans and to do something about this work? And so we're also taking a really kind of data-driven approach to this work because 
the thing about culture can feel very what someone described to me as airy fairy, but I, because it's that kind of feel good morale type thing. But at the end of the day, we can use data and science and should use data and science to help us because it's always our friend. So what we're gonna be doing to support managers is I have reallocated um, someone from our employee relations department, which is a part of our human resources group. And she's a professional coach. And so she, a lot of times her role is like when, when conflict has gotten really bad and now we're, we're dealing with potential harassment or any kind of claim, she's always in like this reactive position on the back end when things have bubbled up and they've bubbled over. I'm, and she's one of our strongest coaches and strongest like change management leaders. I'm repositioning her to put her to coach the managers on the front end proactively. So it's using a resource I already had and just repositioning it so that she does something that's really beneficial because what I just did not wanna do was basically dump survey results on managers and say, figure it out, fix it, and I'll talk to you in six months. That just did not feel fair. And so what she's gonna be doing is take those survey results and do some strength and gap analysis. You know, She's going to facilitate division and department discussions to get those insights as to like, hey, what does this mean? So that we can have like shared, so we can confirm and have a shared understanding of what our strengths and gaps are. And then we can build strategies based off of that and make those prioritizations. And then she's gonna directly work with those managers to, and directors to coach them throughout that action plan because they're still gonna need help on how to do that. The other cool thing is we're working with about two to three other professional coach volunteers who are gonna help us so that we have more of a capacity for this. So this is also, there's a lot of professional coaches out there with some fancy credentials who are like hungry to get involved and help support your managers with this work. And we're gonna continue to measure and celebrate the continuous improvement. And the way that we're thinking about this, this is our listening cadence. So every March we'll do a big annual engagement survey. In June, we'll just do a pulse check. It could be anything timely, it could relate to the survey, it could not relate to the main survey. It could just be anything that we need to kind of do a temperature check in that moment, we're gonna reserve for a June pulse check. In September, we'll do a mid-year pulse check. This is where we wanna kind of start to measure, are the things we identified in March and the solutions we've started to put forward, are they the right things? Because are we starting to see change? And then in December, another pulse check. So I, the idea is that our staff will hear from us every three months and we're gonna be hearing from them and the most important thing is to do something with that information. People don't have survey fatigue. They have fatigue with giving their opinion and feeling like nothing happens with it. And so this is kind of the accountability expectations we're building in. And so that in a, in a nutshell is kind of how we at Best Friends are approaching culture. And so I wanted to just pause I know that's a lot of information and see if anyone has any questions or wants me to go and talk about anything um, specific. So to, to the group. Jose, for those percentages that you shared, it, it, this is all based on like five point scales. So is the, the five is 100 and the four is 80. Is that how you ended up in the 80s yeah. and 90s? Yeah, and it's interesting. It's it's uh, the math is always complicated because Energage uses a seven point scale, <laughs> so like th they had to do some fancy math on the back end where it's like one point two five three. You know, like it's this thing that um, the business intelligence team has made it equitable so that it's like whether it's five or seven, the numbers match up to a hundred for just math simplicity. But it's a seven point scale. Okay. Jose, um, based on your one of your last comments there with respect to staff not having survey fatigue, staff having fatigue about being asked for their feedback and then feeling like nothing happens with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we've all dealt with staff and we've sought feedback and their feedback hasn't necessarily been a way we could move forward. Um, so just from the standpoint of how you handle that messaging, um, it might be beneficial. I, I know that I've been challenged with that, despite the fact that I have personal conversations with staff who raise questions or, you know, I'll try to message back to the whole team if it's more of a, 
um, you know, anonymous question or just been posed by sort of a few people, quote unquote. Um, but if you've got any pointers uh, as far as that goes, it would be great. Yeah, that's a great question, Kathy, because the we definitely interface that, right? Where the feedback is, in some cases, it may be, un, it's a spectrum. It can go from unreasonable be, or just um, not in alignment with our actual mission. So I'll give you an example. When we did a survey at the sanctuary, some of the feedback was, we need less volunteers. Like we're just so overwhelmed, less volunteers, which is the complete opposite, which is we're like more volunteers in more ways that we've never thought about before. And so that's an example where we would, we would come back and we always share the results and say, here's a big highlight. And so it prompted us to go and have additional meetings with some of that team and say, this actually, we hear you, let's, it, let's talk through this and let's understand that that's not an option for all of these reasons. It just, that's not in alignment with our mission. But what I'm hearing from you is actually that you're overwhelmed and feel like you can't actually engage with volunteers and do your job because in your, the way you're positioning this is that volunteers are more work. And so we knew we needed, we still have to and can, will continue to do work and training the staff so that they see that it's a, an investment and volunteers are actually there to be helpful. And there were also things that they said in terms of how we onboard volunteers and how we kind of set them all up where we really weren't setting up the animal care staff for the greatest success. So they also had some things that we could improve and address to make that easier and better. So a lot of times I'll say like, we're not able to do this, We, but I want to address your concerns. Are there ways we can make the situation better without just saying less volunteers in that example? And so I do think it's important that we are transparent. And I think for me, as long as our whys are reasonable, and I think it's pretty reasonable to say we need the help of volunteers and it's a way to get them engaged. We are a nonprofit that is predicated off of the generosity of people like our volunteers. Like it's in our livelihood. Like we need volunteers and donors and people to be engaged meaningfully in the mission because we have such a strong case that makes sense. It's easier to kind of give that feedback. And then there's cases where we'll have things that are hard, like we're not paid enough. And that's frustrating. And I'll look at the animal care staff and I tend to believe in our industry, we grossly underpay frontline workers. Like I think it's one of the biggest problems of our entire industry. We've got that piece wrong, um, especially for the work that I know these folks are doing on the front line. And we say like, they're the heart of the organization and the fact that they're the lowest paid never jives with me personally. And at the time, it, that's a hard thing because I think we want to pay people more, but can we afford to, you know? And so it becomes a much bigger thing. And so those things do become really complicated. And so like the way we handled it at Best Friends, we had to really look at the compensation and we're doing a compensation study right now to see like, should we pay and can we pay differently? But I don't know what the full, I don't know that it'll ever go as far as people would like it to, you know? Um, and so I think that there's always going to be certain limitations. And I think the key is to be authentic and super like honest about it, about that. Are there other ways we can show appreciation for staff? You know, are there other resources we can do? Can I enhance benefits for people? Can I think about their workloads in, in a way that make their jobs easier to do? You know, so I'm always like, I'm never one to just write someone off like, oh, that's unreasonable. That, that's too hard. I can't do it. I always want to dig in deeper and peel that onion to see what other truths or actions we can take um, from that. This is so amazing. Thank you. Sarah, did you have a question? Yes. So with that, thank you, uh, Jose. With that example, what did you, measures did you take to make it um, easier for staff to work with volunteers in addition to do all their animal care work. Yeah, so one of the things that we're, we're transitioning to start to look at is, so at Best Friends, at the sanctuary in particular, for that example, we have a volunteer team and they do a lot of different things from getting people ready, um, they check them in. And so we've actually are changing the model. So the goal is to actually have the volunteer team go, instead of spending a lot of time doing a lot of coordination from the computer, it's like, what things can we automate and how can we get this, these volunteer staff actually out in there with the staff so that they can work alongside the staff 
so that they can kind of orient people and they can also demonstrate like, here's how you can onboard a volunteer in five minutes and get them set up so that you can go do other more critical things that they may not have the ability to do at that point. And so we're starting to just leverage our the volunteer team differently so that they play more of that critical role in engaging the volunteers because historically it was they do everything to get them there they might check them in and then they get sent off to an area and then it's that staff who have um, who is chartered with really doing the engagement and that was the part that was stressing out the staff it was like i'm trying to feed i'm trying to do all these things and i'm trying to have volunteers at various levels um you know help me and that's exhausting um and so that that was one of the things that we uh are starting to do and i think we still haven't solved it. We need to do it better still. So am I hearing you, um, so the volunteers are taking on a little bit more hands-on responsibility um, with regard to the animal care? So yeah, the volunteer staff um, is taking on more of that kind of um, the intermediary role where they're kind of the bridge from the volunteers to the volunteers and the staff. Because we do want like volunteers to do any and all things that are safe, <laughs> essentially, you know, we really believe in that. And um, we're still on our journey. So it's one of the, and it's interesting because culture, like the, the life-saving center in LA might not have as much of a challenge with that. The sanctuary has a very unique kind of culture, you know, then, then from the New York program and the LA program. And so it's interesting because the LA program doesn't necessarily have that same struggle as the sanctuary does. And it's also because the sanctuary is just so spread out and the and the um, temperament of some of the animals, specifically the dogs that we have, um, they need a lot more extra attention, you know? Bobby, were you gonna say something? Uh, I just, I love this conversation. You know me, I'm, I'm, I'm about this life just like you. Um, one of the questions uh, I had um, is typically, and speaking from your experience running a municipal agency, uh, that oftentimes have uh, unions, um, when you are going to be engaging um, staff that are represented by unions, how do you navigate through the space of uh, engaging the union staff about surveying the staff? Uh, and then what level of accountability do you think there is um, with sort of the results and the feedback and also keeping the union in the loop? So, um, I worked with a unionized, unionized workforce um, all throughout Pima, and so it's interesting. My one of my goals was always to become friends with the union rep, and just to show them like I care too. Like I'm really vested in the staff having a great experience. I want them to have training too. I want our, you know, I want our discipline process to be equitable and fair and reasonable. And so I think. I always encourage folks to like really build a relationship with your union rep and let them know it's not an us versus them thing like and actually together we could actually better support the staff. And so I think bringing them in, you know, early on to say hey you know we really want to make this an even better place to work, we need to get information from the staff we're planning on doing this survey. A lot of times they're just, it's good for them to just be in the loop I don't necessarily in some cases I don't I don't know if certain. I haven't been aware of any like municipality that's not allowed to survey their staff because of union and things like that. So I'm not sure how that would work, uh, but I do like to make them a part of the process the whole way through, whether from that sharing out results, you know, and I would also say, you know, work with your county city administrators, because I know there's a lot of um, nuances to engaging with unions like I know in the beginning, I think our county was a little nervous that I wanted to just have such direct contact with the union rep because most of the division leaders didn't want that um, and didn't do that. And so I had to kind of help my administrators know that I had the competence and the ability, the savvy to navigate those conversations. And so definitely get your union um, involved. If you think that that is important, I've also worked with some organizations who their staff is unionized, but not very active. And so the union's there, but there's no presence then if there is already no presence, then I don't, I wouldn't, then you'll know what to do in terms of your specific situation. And what was your second part of your question, Bobby? Uh, no, I, I think you pretty much summed it up. I, I do have another question though, and it kind of relates to what Joy was talking about earlier about, you know, your culture also relates on how you're engaging with your community. So how um, at Best Friends are you sort of 
quantifying the internal culture shift into a better client experience or a better change of perception for your agency? I love this question. Um, so I'll tell you kind of my personal mission. And so when you see the guiding principles in action document, when we were building this, one of my genuine like intentions is that people leave best friends a better human than when they got here. And I really think that if we leverage our values in a way that's not virtue signaling and virtue signaling with values means you have these values, they're cute, they live on a, they live on, you know, um, a website and leaders do all the things that are in complete opposition to those things every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which happens a lot. I'm guilty of that. Like I have done that too, you know? So it's also not a judgment thing. Like being a leader is hard. <laughs> so that's one of the things um, that was really important to us was to, sorry, I lost my train of thought, Bobby. Ask me your question one more time. <laughs> Just how you're quantifying the chain. The ah, yes, yes, culture, yes. Yeah. So part of it is because we also want to, hire, and I'm very careful with this. When I talk about hiring for culture, I, for me, it's important that you have to be really clear about what your culture is and you need to have a culture of belonging and inclusion. That needs to be part of it. If you're going to say things like I'm hiring for culture, because otherwise you'll define your culture and you'll just hire the same kind of archetype for that. And that actually could be the opposite of producing diversity in your workforce. So unless belonging and inclusion and diversity and equity are built into your actual values, I would be very careful about saying we're hiring for culture. So I like to say, I like to hire people who are gonna be additive to our culture. They're gonna make it even better because, and so by doing that, so Bobby, like when I think about by hiring and thinking about what our culture is, and hiring for people who are really in alignment with that, I think authentically we then hire people who are able to deliver, you know, better client service. You know, I think by virtue of, you know, and I'll be super honest, when I was 18 and I was in that interview at Pima Animal Care Center, I'm quite sure I said, which is kind of funny coming from me, love animals and hate people. Because I think I was that that narrative when I was in vet tech school was just always there. And so I heard the teacher talk about that. My peers talked about that. So I just was like, I guess this is what I think, even though actually I'm a pretty people oriented person. And so like nowadays, like that wouldn't fly at all, you know, and because that's the antithesis of the culture we're, we're hoping to continue to cultivate here at Best Friends. You know, I want people who are curious. I want people who like and enjoy interacting with other people, especially those, especially important for those front facing roles. But someone was like, well, if they're not face interacting with the public, does it matter? I'm like, they're interfacing with me. And I, you know, and so I still deserve to be treated kindly. You still deserve to be treated kindly. So I actually think all of our positions require that kind of level of liking people. I'm not saying you have to love and be outgoing and search for the, all that connection, but you have to, if you're someone who's like, I hate people and I would love to just like focus on my data in this corner and never talk to anybody, that still isn't someone who I think is going to work well and thrive in our culture, you know, because the other thing too is there's your outfacing customers and clients, but we are customers and clients to each other. You know, I think of human resources, we are a support, our customer are our clients. And so I'll give you an example of how we're starting to shift things is, so what we've done with our human resource department, we had kind of like a person who was the human resource person in LA and New York and in Atlanta and at the sanctuary. And so I got this team and we, and they were all reporting into different people. So even human resources was operating a little differently at every single place, similar, right? Like you, if any of you have multiple locations, it's like, that location does their foster program kind of like this. And that one does this. It's really easy when you have separation for there to just be a difference in how they operate. And so we brought all of the human resource folks together. And now what they're called are employee engagement managers. We took all of the staff by region and we divided them up into portfolios. And so every person has a portfolio and their job is to be the bridge for those people and the organization. So like they're, so every person has their go-to person from a human resource perspective to get connected to the organization. These employee engagement managers connect with the staff with their portfolio at least once or twice a quarter. That's just like the proactive ones. For new hires, they're completely taking on the onboarding and making sure there's extra high touch points at the beginning because 
I think this idea of like, we hire you and you throw you in, that's what causes a lot of their turnover rate. How someone experiences the first 30, 60, 90 days greatly determines their opinion of how they feel about the organization. So they could become jaded in those 30, 60, 90 days and still work for you for five years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so onboarding becomes so, so important. And so we're even re-leveraging our current departments and saying, how can we change how they do their work to actually deliver more of that client service kind of relationship to the staff um, so that we're curating and cultivating more of that belonging and inclusion at, um, at our organization. I have a question for you and I, I'm sorry, my internet keeps going in and out, which is why my video is not on and all the things, but and so I, I might have missed this because I've been like bounced in and out of this meeting like six times, but um, how are you quantifying, and maybe you, maybe you aren't, are you quantifying sort of looking at racial diversity within the organization, looking at gender diversity, sexual orientation? Yeah, all yeah. yeah so there's a few things. So through our, and so the other thing that, um, that and then I'll answer your question, one of the reasons why we're putting such an emphasis on culture is because our diversity, equity, and inclusion work is part of our culture. It's not separate because if culture is how we do things, then it's important that DEI doesn't become its own standalone strategy that maybe has a start and it, it feels like it could have an end date as though you just arrive at some point, which you don't, not with culture, not with life-saving, not with DEI, right? These are all philosophies and ethics that we work towards every single day. And so, there is an effort that we're gonna be doing to start to better understand the various demographics that we do have amongst our workforce um, so that we can better know what we should be working on. You know, So for instance, I know that from a diversity through the dimension of race and ethnicity, Best Friends doesn't have as much diversity as we are gonna to work towards acquiring over time. And so, but I'm still curious about like, where is that diversity? Is the 10% diversity that we have in entry-level positions, what does that pipeline look like so that folks can be in leadership roles? Because that's what's really important. And the other piece to that is in the absence of diversity amongst a, of, you know, a governing body, whether it's your executive team, your senior leadership team, your board, there has to be a whole lot of awareness that those perspectives aren't there. And so there has to be work to make sure that somehow they get brought to the table, right? So that's something we're, we're working on as it relates to the DEI stuff. So Rory, yes, we're gonna be collecting that information. We are working with um, some of our data people and our HR folks and our general counsel because that's protected class information. So we also wanna be really thoughtful of that, how we collect this information, and to ensure that it's leveraged in a really thoughtful way. The other thing that's really interesting about our survey and working with Energage is at the end of the survey, people can opt into, um, into some demographic questions, you know, you know age ranges, um, at selection of race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, those kinds of the protected class. Because what we're also able to get insights on are how does our survey look from the BIPOC group, you know, how does the how does the, how do these different protected classes experience our culture? Those insights, I think, are going to be also really helpful in driving our diversity, equity, and inclusion work, which is really centered in our um, diversity work as well, in our culture work. Awesome, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Jose. I'm not going to let you get through this whole hour with at least one COVID-related question. So okay. As we are moving to our new normal uh, and as uh, vaccines are becoming accessible um, for staff and we are trying to keep our staff and the community safe, how is Best Friends dealing with the culture of people that maybe aren't comfortable or don't want to get vaccinated while there are a lot of staff that feel uncomfortable being with staff that are unvaccinated? Yeah, what a challenging situation because there's also a lot of rules from like, if you can recommend vaccine versus um, what's the word uh, encouraging, like there's all these things that you, it's, it's, I did not know there was going to be this many slippery slopes from the EEOC, but so I've been doing a lot of work in that space. So how we're handling it, and this by no means is like the best. So if someone has ideas to like, <laughs> feel free to let me know. Um, 
one of the things Julie is doing is sharing about just so like, for instance, we had a, a Zoom call today with all of our staff to actually talk about the culture work that I shared today. And she kicked it off with um, a follow up from a meeting last week where she was just like, I want to check in on everybody. How's everyone feeling? Hopefully folks start to feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is this vaccine available. I'm getting it. We want to make sure that for if you're a salaried employee, just take the, your time, do whatever you need to do. For hourly staff, everyone was given an additional four hours to be able to use a PTO to go get their vaccine. So really making it easy for those who do want to get the vaccine. We have regular, uh, we have bi-monthly communications with like, here's what to know. Here's what the CDC is saying. Here is where, here are some links and resources that where you can sign up for a vaccine. So we're basically like sharing the information and then allowing the staff to make the decisions that they want. We're not yet in a space requiring it or not. For staff who are like concerned about working with colleagues that don't have a vaccine, the reality is they've been working, you know, for a year with folks that aren't. And so unless there is a, a actual accommodation that needs it, that is needed through the ADA, we're just kind of handling that on a one-on-one -on -one if it's reasonable and we can just make a simple schedule change We'll do something like that because um, we want people to be comfortable, but it also can't be one of those things where everyone has like something they want because any of us who've managed schedules like it just becomes unreasonable to try and staff your operation with what everyone um, is hoping for so only like actual ADA accommodations, but in general like that's kind of how we're approaching uh, vaccines. So I'm actually curious from everybody. So I, so this culture work I've been working on for like a year and a half, I actually just presented it to the staff two hours ago uh, because our, our first, our survey goes live on Monday. I'm kind of curious, what do you all think about it? Like, and don't hurt my feelings. Like what feels off about it too? Like this is the first go around. I'm, I'm in deep learning mode. So I'm, I'm really curious to just like general thoughts and reactions and how we're thinking about approaching our culture. Do you all hate it? No, why is it Kathy from oh. Canada who always talks? <laughs> Looks like anyway. Jen unmuted too. Oh, if you want okay, to give Jen, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Well, <laughs> um, Jen, it's nice to see you. Hi, it's been it's so long. Nice, nice to see you yeah. as well. I was just going to say, I completely love your approach. Um, I love how you present it. I love how you, um, I, I loved all of that just from the beginning. And, I, and I'm not saying that because I already loved you. It's not that, like, seriously, I, I had a meeting recently that, uh, you know, some people just come at it in a way that is such um, very aggressive and very standoffish. And you, the way you just presented all of that was just very engaging and very open, very honest, and just, um, I think it's a great way to go about it. And I, I'm like, man, I wish I had you here to do that with our staff and to help to guide that because I, I just think it was really well done. So there was my, there's my feedback. Thanks. One of the things like, so when I first moved into this role, oh, you know, someone said something to me that was really interesting. And they said, are you worried about becoming irrelevant to our movement? Because you're just going to become this best friends person who just works on best friends and you're not going to be working with shelters. It really got to me, like it got to my ego, right? And then I'm like, no, this is what I want to do. But I actually, my goal or a goal is like, as we start to like show proof of concept with this at Best Friends and we see it working, I think that's something that I want to be able to do is work with our shelter partners and like helping them kind of how we do different, whether we go into life-saving assessments and things like that. I could see us in the future becoming a resource to kind of help orgs do this because this work is hard and it can be really confusing and I'm all for like, if we have a model that we can start to right size for us, like, let's do it. That's one of the reasons why I'm excited to share this all with you, because this isn't proprietary. This is for all of us so that we as a movement can benefit from this. We Lord knows we need it because it's a hard field. Yeah, and you really have to come off in a way that that really engages the team and and the surveys the way the surveys because some people they don't want to share that information other people are happy to to share who they are in every aspect about themselves and others just don't want to do that and so having 
you know, the sensitivity of the questionnaires and the opting out and, you know, just, just, it just felt very well thought through and, and, um, uh, I had another thought with that, but, uh, so I just went out of my, my mind. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. I but understand. Go ahead. <laughs> Kathy, did you have something? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> I can I can say that uh, uh, the only reason I don't love you is because I don't really know you. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, I appreciate uh, what you've provided for a couple of reasons. One, you're so sincere. It's very clear that you're very passionate and very invested in in ensuring everybody has the best possible experience. So you're very thoughtful about your approach. And as a result, the approach is extremely comprehensive. Those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and it's so many wonderful people who helped with this. And our North Star has always, like when I was putting, so because I, you know, when Julie appointed me in this role, there was no budget, there was no staff. It was like, figure this out. And so I knew that I needed to kind of go within the organization and pull people who are passionate about this and had different levels of expertise to like, how do I use what I, what is within best friends? Um, because it is there, there's 800 people there. I can absolutely tap into that. Right. Um, and so I'm always reluctant to say that because it instantly feels so unapproachable <laughs> or, uh, you know, but it's interesting. It's big, but feels small at the same time when you actually work in it. And the, when I was selecting people, my main thing was I need people who like genuinely, authentically care so deeply about the staff like that, because that's a North Star. This is for the staff. And it's not about just getting like high marks and chasing some arbitrary rate or any of those kinds of things. It was about like, how do we actually cultivate the kind of environment that is going to allow people to be their very best self at work where they're fulfilled. Like, that's the thing. I want people to have joy and fulfillment at work. Um, because I think that when you have that, you're able to go out into the world and just be better. And I think the world needs that. And so this is kind of my attempt to try and make the world a little bit better. We're all just so addicted to your energy, Jose. <laughs> Uh, question question for you, brother. So yeah, let's talk about obviously working for Julie, you, you're working for a visionary who's just so invested in this culture. And there's, you know, obviously leaders on this call too that are invested in it, but there's some line staff that might not have that same level of buy-in from their high level leadership. And so uh, from a, uh, a strategy of managing up about culture, what are some tips that you might be able to give people that really want to invest into this? Yeah, so, and I don't think we've cracked solve this yet at Best Friends. Um, it's one of, I, I would say it's like one of our biggest things that we need to solve for. Best Friends feels very much like two workforces, a remote workforce, and then folks who are rooted in operations and life-saving centers. And those two folks I know have just very different experiences. And the reality is like the folks who are on the front lines don't have opportunities to jump on these calls with Julie or me. And so we're really looking at, well, what are their meetings? You know, how can we get, how do, how can me and Julie go to their morning huddles or their monthly operations meetings? So rather than trying to make a workforce work in a way that goes completely against how they work, how can we adjust and mold ourselves to what works for them? It's that also, it's that idea of servant leadership. Like I am here to be of service to you. So you shouldn't bend to accommodate me. I need to bend to kind of accommodate you in a reason with, you know, bend without breaking. And so um, some of, the, so that's kind of what we're doing. We also have um, the way we're approaching our DEI work are through these things called culture councils. And one of those councils is called the love council, living our values council. And it's a cohort of staff. And one of their main charters is to kind of start to really help us have a much better frontline staff engagement um, kind of uh, dynamic. And so we're actually going to start to create some, some think groups that are comprised of all of the different kinds of folks who are more in that operation capacity. So people who work in maintenance to animal care, to people who are doing our community cat programs out in the field, like et cetera, right? People who are just not in front of a computer. And we are going to really ask them, how should we be engaging? Like, I'm, I don't want to make this up. What is meaningful to you? What communication is meaningful to you? You know, and so really starting to get much more intentional and clear 
about being of service to that group because it's not a one size fits all. There are some things that are org wide initiatives and we need to figure out how to deliver that with different strategies because I almost like every staff group is like a different market. And so you need to think about the way we communicate and engage with them differently because one way, one platform, will never catch everybody. And that's how people get left behind. And so, and honestly, the first step is acknowledging that to the staff and saying, we have come short, you know, engaging all of you. We say things like you're the most important and we have not done anything super meaningful to actually get you engaged as a part of this. And so um, I'm also working a lot with those operation managers to say, hey, what works for you? So today we had this big Zoom call. So for weeks I've been saying, we have the Zoom call. What do you need from me to get your team to attend this? It's so important. And if they can't attend it, do you want me to do that same presentation for you and your team at a time that works for you? And so, and I'm doing that with some groups where I'm going in and just doing that because they need that extra attention and damn it, they deserve it, you know? So that's kind of how we're thinking about it. And so we, I would say we have so much work to do in that space. We have not even kind of touched it in the way that it needs to be. This hour does fly by. <laughs> I was like, I feel like they're just gonna be staring at me and I'm not gonna have anything to say. I should know better, I'm talkative. <laughs> so 157, any, any last question? Do you wanna tell us a little bit more about the cultural councils and the think groups? Are the think groups like subgroups of the culture? Yeah, so like the, the, the frontline employee think groups are going to be a subgroup of the living our values council so basically what we've done we've looked at our and again this was driven by the staff they identified all the different parts of our organization that de and i should be um, really a part of and where we should embed de and i as a part of that and so they span from like internal communication external communication working with donors and volunteers staff you know recruitment um, promotions, you know, all of those kinds. Of, it really runs the gamut of, of all of them. And on our, um, no, let me see if I could pull it up. Well, on the Best Friends Network site, if you were to like search diversity, there's, we've done some town halls where, um, and actually the last two town halls, one, with, one was with Julie Castle and the other was with James Evans. And we interviewed the, the councils and they kind of talked a little about that, but they're also still very um, new. And I think we're actually taking a giant deep breath and probably taking, it's in our nature to want to get tactical and solution oriented and build things out. And we're really going to, we're pausing almost, and we're taking a step back because we as human beings that can make up this organization still have a lot of work to do before we can actually meaningfully inform what a new process should be. Otherwise we're bringing that same knowledge to the, to the problem. So we'll re, we'll make something new but it would basically be the same thing in a new dress, you know? And so we're just having a reconciling the fact that we actually need to do a lot more self-reflection and work before we start building out toolkits and things like that. So lots of staff panels having very honest, um, courageous conversations about race, religion, politics. We're going there. Yay me for moderating that. That's always very stressful and fun. <laughs> All right, I think we're at time. Well, I appreciate the invite to get to spend some time with all of you. Um, thank you for everything you all do. Like you have such hard jobs and important jobs and yeah, um, let me know if you need anything. <laughs> thank you so much, Jose. It's so wonderful to have you here. All right, take care everyone. Bye. Talk soon everyone.